Hello and welcome to chapter 8. This is all about evolution and natural selection and everything that goes into that. So I guess we should start out by talking about what evolution is and uh, just very simply defined evolution is a genetic change in a population over time. So it's got some important parts there. It has to be genetic. The, the trait that we're talking about has to be in the DNA, coded for by the DNA. And we're not talking about how individuals change over time. We're talking about how a population changes over time. And we often think about time as being from one generation to the next, but it doesn't have to be. But that's kind of like a really convenient way to think about it is time being one generation to the next. So the other part of this definition is that it happens in a population. And uh, this is a term that we're going to be seeing throughout the rest of the semester, um, a population is a group of organisms from the same species. Now, I'm not giving you the definition of species yet. That gets complicated. We'll get that in the next chapter. But it's the group of organisms from the same species that live in a particular geographic region. So this region can be pretty small. Um, you could talk about the population of fish in a pond, right, or a test tube. Or it could be something really large, like um, Lake Michigan, like the fish in Lake Michigan. Um, population, you have to kind of define what that region is. So again, they have to be the, the same species, though. That's, that's pretty critical. So evolution is genetic change in a population over time. Um, a lot of people who are unfamiliar with evolution, they say things like, well, we've never seen evolution occur, so how can it be real? But the truth is that we can see evolution occurring and your book does a really good job with an example of a study stepping you through exactly how they set up this study showing that evolution can in fact occur in fruit flies. So you know like how does this happen and um, how is this happening between generations and is the change genetic and all of these things are really important questions to be asking and hopefully as I explain this the study to you, it will make sense. So let's let's get into the details of this experiment. Um, starting out here with these fruit flies. Now they didn't keep the fruit flies in like a fish tank like you see here, but it's it's kind of nice to, to understand that we've got a population of fruit flies. And so um, one of the things that you need to know is that each of these flies in this tank are representing five hundred fruit flies and there's 10 of them in there so there's they used 5,000 fruit flies in this study so lots of individuals that's good the next thing that you should know about these fruit flies is that they actually eat food um, like mashed bananas or things like that you know fruit um, and they also lay their eggs in those fruit so um, so we have a really nice study here because these fruit flies cannot eat and they also cannot reproduce without the food being present. So the first thing they do is they remove the food. And of course what happens if you're not feeding fruit flies is that they uh, will starve to death. Uh, so the, um, the average starvation death for all of them to die, like for every single fruit fly to die, that can take around 35, 40 hours, something like that. Um, so, you know, almost two days, day and a half, two days, for them all to die without food. But they didn't let them all die. They waited until 80% of them died. So there's only a thousand fruit flies left out of those original 5,000. And what they did was they recorded the time it took for, for these fruit flies to, to die. And once they were only left with 20% of that population, they put the food back in to the population and the fruit flies that survived, they could now eat and they could also reproduce, right? So we have this subset of the population that are surviving to reproduce. So um, what, they're, what they're doing with this study is they're trying to see if fruit flies can evolve to live longer under these starvation uh, uh, situation, circumstances. So this is the results of their data. This is the original population. The average starvation was 20 resistance. That means how long they could live on average without food was 20 hours. The maximum was right around 35 or 40 hours. 
And after a single generation of starving, in other words, those original thousand survivors, their actual time that it took them to um, get to the average, that, that changed, it shifted from 20 hours to 23 hours. So um, then they repeated this experiment over and over again for 60 generations. And over that course of those 60 generations, um, the average starvation resistance was 160 hours. Just to put that in perspective, that's almost a week. So they went from being able to, to live less than a day on average to being able to live over a week on average um, without any food. So this is a genetic change in the population over time because only the ones that, um, that were surviving passed on those successful starvation resistance genes on to the next generation. And we call that evolution, right, because it's a genetic change in the population over time. And you might now ask, how did this evolution occur? And it was actually Darwin who figured out how evolution occurred, at least one of the ways. We actually have four ways we'll talk about. Um, but he called this method that is being described here, he called that natural selection. And this definition here of natural selection. It's a really good one. It's got all the parts that you need to know about. We'll go over it again a couple more times in this lecture. But basically, natural selection is what happens when individuals in the population are being born with certain characteristics that help them survive better and reproduce more than other individuals in the population. Remember from lab, we talked about it's a relative frequency, right? Some are surviving better than others. The, the relative frequency of survival is better for some than others. So that's what we're talking about here. There are all these individuals in the population. Some of them have characteristics that help them survive, like starvation resistance. And those are the ones that reproduce more. Um, so you might argue that what you see here with the fruit flies is not, in fact, natural selection. You might argue that it is artificial selection. And all that artificial selection is, is natural selection done by humans. There is no difference in the basics of what goes into natural selection. I mean, except for that humans are doing it with a goal in mind. Natural selection causes all these kinds of similar results where some are living more than others and some survive better than others or reproduce better. But, um, it's, it's not goal-oriented, whereas artificial selection is almost always goal-oriented. Let's make a bigger flower. Let's make more kernels of corn on a corn cob, that kind of thing. So I mentioned Darwin, and, um, and I want to talk a little bit about Darwin, because, you know, before Charles Darwin came around, most people on this planet believed that uh, all species were created separately as individual units and that they were unchanging. And this is the world that Darwin grew up in. Um, we knew our place in the world in the 19th century um, and those beliefs of unchanging species, those had been held for most of European history, at least for 2,000 years, probably longer than that. And so what, what Charles Darwin the world that he came into was that, you know, it, it didn't quite make sense to him. Um, the biblical explanations were not as uh, sufficient for him eventually uh, as, as they were for other people. So we're going to talk more about how new species come into being, you know, because he, he wrote this book called The Origin of Species, and we'll get into that in chapter 10. But for now, Let's just say that species are any individual organism that, uh, that can breed or interbreed with each other. If, if those organisms can interbreed but not with members of another species, we like to call it a different species. Okay. So, so here's Darwin. And one of the things that I want you to know about him is that we not only know that species do change, that's evolution. But now we also know how they change, and that's natural selection. It's important to know that Darwin did not come up with his idea all on his lonesome. 
He was influenced by lots of scientists before him, and I'm going to talk to you about these briefly. I have a few uh, slides on some of these individuals too, but he, he didn't just smash the worldview of, of uh, the Bible and European sensibilities on his own. And he didn't do it all at once, and he did not do it by himself. So he stood on the shoulders of giants, like George Buffon, who he, you know, he, he did publish a lot of stuff, but basically what he said was that the Earth is actually way older than the 6,000 years that people thought it was based on um, the interpretation from the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't say that the Earth is 6,000 years old. Um, that is just kind of an interpretation that some people... Uh, made up based on what they were reading in the Bible, so an interpretation. Um, next comes Georges Cuvier, and he was looking at fossils, and one of the big deals that he said was that uh, extinction occurs. Now, this was a huge deal, because according to the Bible, God made all the species, and, and those species are unchanging, and of course, unchanging also means not going extinct. And so, Georges Cuvier, said, well, no, we see extinctions happening. So that was, that was a pretty big influence on Darwin. The next guy is Lamarck. I have a, a couple of slides talking about Lamarck. So let me just briefly tell you that he was one of the people before Darwin that actually said that species, living things, they might change over time. Now, he wasn't right with how it happened. That was Darwin that got it right. But it still was an influence to Darwin. And then finally, there Charles Lyell. And Charles Lyell, he was a geologist, and he's basically looking at how the Earth changes and how slowly the Earth changes and erosion and things along those lines. And so those slow, gradual changes that you see in the Earth, well, Charles Darwin thought that that could happen with species, living things as well. And of course, he was right. So just a little bit more on some of, some of those guys, like Cuvier. Uh, just important to know that Cuvier was not looking at at Mastodon's Irish elk and ground sloths, but we do know that these are no longer around right now, um, and they're, they're fossils. They went extinct, and so there's just tons and tons of accounts um, of actual evidence of species going extinct. To us today, it's not that big a deal, but this was a ground-shaking, earth-shattering concept a couple hundred years ago. No, no way things could go extinct. And, and of course, this is very acceptable to us today. And it was a big influence on Darwin. Uh, Charles Lyell was that geologist I talked to you about. He wrote a book in the 1830s, and the timing of this book is kind of important because he published this book like right before Darwin went on his famous trip. Uh, so the books that he published were, was called The Principles of Geology. And again, just repeating what I said before, that these geological forces are shaping the earth, they happened in the past, they're continuing to happen now, and so there's these gradual changes that we're seeing, these gradual constant changes that we see and that happened in the past, and that's how you can get mountains building up, for example, or the Grand Canyon being forged. So Darwin did bring this book with him on his, um, on his voyage, and, and it really influenced him. The last guy on that list that I want to talk to you about is Lamarck, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And I told you that he had this idea of how organisms change over time, but he didn't get it right. So let me explain to you what his idea was. And we're going to use these giraffes as an example. This is not from your book. But basically what he thought was, um, he came up with this idea called the theory of acquired characteristics. And that, that says a lot, acquired characteristics. What that means is, that the organisms acquire the trait in their lifetime and so they can gain a trait or they can lose a trait in their lifetime. So this giraffe is actually the same giraffe four times. So we've got this short neck giraffe that due to the need to reach these leaves, they um, stretch their neck and they get taller and taller and taller. And so that's what they, that, that's what Lamar thought. Over, not between generations, but within an individual, uh, you would have this driving need, or you would use something or not use something, and you would gain it or you would lose it if you didn't use it. Uh, so 
the key important thing here to Lamarck is that this giraffe here would then reproduce and have babies, and all those babies would actually be born with long necks because the parent stretched its neck because the parent needed to. Now you have to understand that this is a rejected theory. There is literally no evidence that this is how it works with giraffes. And Darwin read this Lamarck's book before he went on his journey, and you know, he like he's kind of ruminating on this, he's kind of thinking about this. Um, and eventually it was Darwin that showed that Lamarck's theory was really quite wrong and gave an alternative. So Darwin actually, his own adventures kind of influenced his own life too. Um, as a young man, age 16, he enters the University of Edinburgh uh, to study medicine. And that's one of the reasons he did this is because his father was a doctor. And you know, you know how that goes. Parents want you to be successful like they are, so do you do the same job? Um, he stays there for two years. Um, this is actually at the University of Edinburgh where he becomes familiar with Lamarck's books. So he only stays two years. Basically, he's a dropout. And that's okay. Well, he didn't want to be a doctor. He only he figured out his life path. He didn't want to be a doctor. His parents were very disappointed, um, of course, I guess, as like you do. But, um, but he did go on to study at Cambridge University. And from Cambridge, he got his degree in theology. Yes, you heard it. He has a degree um, in religion. So the other things that he studied at Cambridge University were biology and geology. He really fell in love with biology and geology in his time at Cambridge University, which, um, you know, it's a good thing to, to explore other passions. But again, his degree, his main degree is in theology. So at this time, he's a graduate of college, and he's, you know, thinking he's going to be this, like, little country pastor or something like that, spending time out in nature when he's not helping the, the constituents of his, of his church. And um, but he gets this offer. So uh, his botany professor at, at Cambridge um, basically helps him get this job as basically it's called a gentleman companion for the captain of this boat called the HMS Beagle. And gentleman companion literally means he's the person who has dinner with the captain because um, they're going to go on this five-year voyage around the world. And back in those days, when society was really hierarchical, the captain did not have anybody to hang out with because he couldn't hang out with the crew. It was very much frowned upon. So who does he ha who can he hang out with? He so he hangs out with Darwin. Um, in the meantime, besides being this kind of friend to the captain, he also is uh, collecting things. Um, like uh, birds and plants and sending them back to England. And they spend a long time around the coast of South America. This takes the majority of their time kind of going back and forth around the coast of, of South America, trying to get a pretty good map. They actually find a shortcut here through Tierra del Fuego, and uh, at least that the Europeans hadn't known before about before. And then they do spend a lot of time in the Galapagos Islands, which become very important to Darwin's discoveries. And of course, the Earth is round, so um, they, get, they head west, and then they, that ends up going on back around to um, to you know New Zealand and, and Australia. Spend a little bit of time there, and then a little bit of time around uh, Africa, back to South America, and then back to London. That took five long years, and you should know, as an aside, that Darwin was completely seasick the whole time, so he was having a much better time on land. And, and so he, he did get off the boat as often as he possibly could. He also ended up like, not getting along very well with the captain, which that's a total aside. Okay, so he goes on this voyage, he comes back, he has all these collected plants and animals and, and rocks and all these kinds of things, and he heads back to London. Um, and now that he's back in England, he, he continues his reading. He loves to read. And he comes across the works of Thomas Malthus. And Thomas Malthus um, wrote a book called The Essay on the Principle of Population. And Malthus um, had this very, he was an economist, um, he had this very interesting and really well-reasoned idea that population, human population, were growing at an exponential rate. 
this curve here is an exponential growth curve. And for a long time, uh, human populations were fairly low, but at this time in the, the mid to late 1800s, we've got this huge increase in population um, in, uh, in Europe and uh, especially, but around the world as well. So exponential growth. So here's where, here's where Malthus um, started to be like a prophesier of doom and gloom. And what he said was that although the human population is increasing exponentially, the food supply, you know, based on his economic uh, understanding, the food supply not increasing exponentially. Now you should know that Malthus did get this blue line wrong. Um, he didn't understand that we were also having increases in technology, which were actually increasing the food supply as well. But that's not important for this story. I mean, this is not an economics class. This is a class or a lecture on evolution and how this information influenced Darwin. So what Darwin said was, well, all populations have the ability to increase exponentially, but they don't. They tend to have a flat growth rate, which is like a zero growth rate. And, but they make more babies than survive. And this was like this eureka moment. This is where Darwin really comes across, uh, figures out his idea of natural selection. Because what he says is that only individuals with the favorable variations are gonna be able to get that food. And if there's too many individuals born and too few resources, only ones with the most favorable variation is gonna win that resource and the other ones are going to lose, and the other ones are going to die. And that's when he suddenly saw this, that favorable variations would tend to be preserved, and unfavorable variations would be destroyed. And um, that's where he got everything kind of falling into place, and he at last got his theory to work, like really figured it out. So summarizing Darwin's idea, um, there's two main points, we'll talk about three in a minute, but these are the two kind of most important ones, I think, is that individuals vary in their traits. If every individual is exactly the same, natural selection can't work. So the other part of this is that those traits have to be heritable, that means they have to be genetic. Even Darwin understood that they have, that trait itself has to be genetic, even though he didn't really understand genetics, and that some traits are better suited to the environment than others. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty complicated set of bullet points. So then he also said that individuals who survive because they have these useful traits, those are the ones that reproduce. So they're reproducing. That means they get their genes into the next generation, just like those fruit flies that survive the starvation. And, um, and so you have differences between one generation and the next. So we're talking about time over time. And so, uh, just a real quick term here for you, reproductive success is also called fitness, and we use this word fitness a lot in this chapter. Um, so just kind of be aware that when we say fitness, we're not talking about strength, we're not talking about cardiovascular fitness or how far you can run, we're talking about your reproductive success. A fruit fly that's not reproducing ha does not have fitness, um, but the one that does have reproduce does have fitness. Okay. So, and again, it's not about survival. It's because it doesn't matter how long they survive. If they don't reproduce, they still have zero fitness. Okay, so I just want to real quickly do a compare and contrast between Lamarck's giraffes and Darwin's idea about what would happen with the giraffes. So, remember, Lamarck said that you've got this, this individuals with short necks, and because they need to, they stretch their necks, and they keep stretching and stretching and stretching, and these same two giraffes uh, at the end of this need, they, they have long, long necks. And remember, that's not how it works. What Darwin said was you have a population of giraffes. Some have longer necks, some have shorter necks, some are in the middle. And um, because the food is so far out of reach, only the ones with the longest necks survive. Remember, they have the characteristic that helps them survive. And all the other ones, they die because they lose the contest. And so in the next generation, the only ones that are going to be able to reproduce are the ones with the longer necks. And so they pass those longer necks on to the next generation. That's a pretty big difference. When we're talking about evolution, it's really important to me that you not use the word need, because if you say, well, they evolved because they needed to, 
then I'm going to assume that you think our mark was right. And, but if you say they evolved because there's variation in the population and some had characteristics that allowed them to survive to reproduce better and that trait was heritable, then you're starting to understand Darwin. Okay, so Darwin, he, he writes this book, but he does not publish it. He first hammers out his idea in 1842. He has this really nice first draft of his books. Um, his book, it's like 35 pages. It's all written in pencil. Um, he kind of fleshes it out over the next few years. And he knew his idea was important, but you know, it was so important that he actually wrote a letter to his wife telling her in case he dies, that he is to, um, to give his, his book uh, and about $1,000 so he could have it published after he dies. By the way, his wife is not a fan of evolution. She is extremely religious, and so she, she, she may or may not have followed through with this. And he also understood that, um, that he would probably be getting in a lot of arguments with people about this idea. I mean, think about the world today. We argue about this idea all the time. And so he's like, he doesn't want to publish it. He really, really doesn't want to publish it. He said something like, uh, as, as soon as he's almost convinced that he should publish it, um, that it, he starts to like think that maybe species aren't uh, changeable. And it's like, by just by saying this, maybe, maybe he's wrong. He like, he feels like he's confessing murder because that's how against what he thinks reality is. So confessing the murder, um, although, you know, he was right. So he put his stuff in a drawer and he didn't even talk about it for, for a long time. I mean, he talked to a few close friends about it. And you should also know that at this time, Darwin was pretty famous for his travels around the world. He wrote books about it. He wrote books about other things too. So he's a pretty famous author, but he doesn't publish this book. And he doesn't publish it, and he doesn't publish it until 1850s, when this other guy, and he's an important guy to Darwin, because although he didn't know Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace had read um, Malthus's book, he had read Lamarck, he had, um, he's, he's also a, a British naturalist, and he's traveling around the world, and he's seeing basically all these things that Darwin saw. And, um, and he comes up with this idea called natural selection. And um, it, he's kind of it, like, he doesn't know what to do with it. So he, he writes this paper up and he sends it to Darwin and said, publish it if you think it's worthy. And well, you know what, this actually crushed Darwin. Like getting this letter, this 14 page letter from Alfred Russell Wallace kind of crushed him because it's like, you know, this young whippersnapper all of a sudden has his own idea and this sucks, and he's like, he doesn't want to let, you know, Wallace take all the credit. But he also realizes that Wallace, he, he came up with the idea, too. So what Darwin did was he took Wallace's letter, and he took his manuscript, and he took it to the Linnaean Society of London, and he had them both published at the same time. So at this time, um, Wallace is actually really, really sick, and he doesn't get back home to England for a, a year. But by this time, Darwin actually publishes not just something in a Linnaean society, um, kind of like a magazine, he actually publishes his book, full fleshed out book. 25 years after his trip ended, he publishes The Origin of Species. And um, kind of cool and interesting, but, but this is why we <laughs> We call it Darwin's idea and not Darwin and Wallace's idea because literally Darwin wrote the book. All right, well, this is a good place to stop. So I'm going to pause this and I'll start up again in a minute with the next video.